money on this. Uh, and that becomes that becomes the problem. That's that's one of the things that's going on with the with the Kickstarters is uh, I don't know. We have to we might have to just leave the uh, the restorations, the remastering of the books alone because uh, the books are just not selling well enough for Diamond to warrant that. Uh, the only things that are selling is, uh, is Cerebus in Hell. And uh, you know, I try and find, okay, what, what's a way to bring in money, not just doing the Cerebus in Hell comic book, but do, let's do this postcard. You can do a postcard every two months. Maybe there will be enough money coming in so that uh, you know the four of us can buy groceries at least, uh, and uh, we'll we'll see. You know, this time next week we'll we'll have a much clearer answer of uh, okay, this is how much money came in, and then the week after that, this is how much money it cost to do the postcard. This is how much money was left over, and when we divided it four ways, uh, this is how much money each guy made. Well, that's one of the things with service and hell that people have mentioned is like they'll go to their comic book store and they're like, oh yeah, there's that new service book, and they go and they look in the C's and they don't find it because Watchvark is under W for Watchvark and Nick Com is under N for Nick Com. That's I, I don't know if I had faxed you, but I had mentioned something to uh, Sean and Ben and David of if we if you guys title the book Service and Hell Presents whatever the one shot is then they'd always get racked under C for service. And maybe people could find them easier and, and maybe sales would go up. But that's one of those, you know, it's it's an intangible that there's no control group of, well, is it going to help or not? Right. There's also the, um, the fact that it's, it's pinballing between uh, 1,900 and 2,100 copies. Um so I'm inclined to think that the retailers are finally uh, finding the bottom. Like this is this is exactly how many of these that we need, and um, like the the problem. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, with Theravis, uh sales went up. You know, after issue five and issue six, which then made it sensible to do a collection um, in order to catch people up on the storyline. Uh, that's not happening with Therapists in Hell, so it seems a lot more sensible to. Uh, just have people figure out, oh, okay, here, here they all are on the back cover. Here's all that are diamond order codes. I just have to go into the store and say, I want this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, and then buy the other ones online. And that's, uh, you know, the 1,900 people taken care of. Right. You don't, you don't, you don't want to be forcing the 1,900 people to buy the same four comic books that they already bought uh, when they've already got those comic books. Right. Well, that's, I know that uh, for Ben Hobbs' column, he he, you know, he, had, he was doing the, uh, here's the 2019 checklist, and then he did the revised checklist, and then he did the revised, revised checklist, and the joke the next week went out, because on Tuesdays I'll say next time Ben Hobbs and whatever. And <laughs> that week it was next time Ben Hobbs and the revised, 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 revised 2019 checklist? Question mark? Because yeah. it seemed like it was changing every week. And, and I could tell that, ben, you know, just reading what Ben was writing, that it was one of those, yeah, we decided not to do that. Now we're going to do, you know, this. And I, I mean, I can see not doing a collection if if the numbers aren't there, because why waste? I mean, it's going to cost how much to 
print versus how many one shots could you print for the same amount? I mean, this this brings me all the way back to when I was doing swords as therapists, and I was getting uh, hate mail from people because I was I put a backup story in it. <laughs> uh, it's like now I have to buy these four comic books that I already own just to get the backup story. And it's like, uh, yeah, I can see that too. But I also see it as, um, here's, here's more therapy. Like, uh, I can't do, I can't do two monthly titles, but if I've got a trade paperback coming out, uh, I, and I work with somebody else, I can maybe do another eight page story. It's like, uh, can I get a round of applause for uh, productivity? Like, no. <laughs> what what you get is uh, is hate mail for forcing me to buy something that I already own. And that's it's one of the, it's the catch twenty two of you know hey I'm gonna collect everything but I'm gonna give you a little something extra. Well, I want something extra. Well, wait till nineteen ninety five and buy the world tour book. about a therapist and health trade paperback and I, I was going, well how do you how do you avoid that? Like uh, and I was thinking if you did the the old science fiction annual thing of just putting the covers on the front cover and the interiors around the interior. So there's absolutely nothing in here that if you have these four issues you don't already have so you don't have to buy this. Right. I mean, I, that's one way. Then I'd probably get hate mail saying, well, couldn't you put some more strips in here? <laughs> I, I believe somebody commented on it when, when it was still on the schedule was, so instead of paying $4 an issue for four issues, I can pay $25 for four issues. You know, I'm not saving any money and I'm... It's one of those, well, yeah, you're, you know, but it's going to cost this much to collect those four issues. You know, the, the cost of paper, the cost of the printing, it's it's tied together, you know. And it would be nice if you guys made a little money on the deal, too. How are, uh, how are comic books priced now? Are they still three ninety nine? Uh, Yeah, for most of them. As far as I know, I don't think they've dropped the price. I know there was talk of dropping prices, but I haven't been to the comic shop in a couple months, so I'm not sure. Okay. How long have comic books been? Three ninety nine. Do you have a, a memory of that? Uh, I remember DC did a big thing when the, they did their New 52, which I think was like five years ago, where they were holding the line at two ninety nine. And, uh, let me see when that was. But that's one of the, one of the questions of, uh, I have to admit, I have a big mental block against, um, uh, going to 450 or something like that on, uh, on Cerebus in Hell. It's like four dollars seems like above the the maximum that you could do. I, I, that's when I wonder, like, are we ready for the five dollar comic book? I don't think so. Because it seemed to me that they did sort of jump from three dollars to four dollars. Yeah. Like there's there's ter there's territory in between there, um, but it does. It does seem odd to even talk about, uh, well, okay, do we do a three and a quarter comic? Or do we do a 350 comic? Or do we do a, a 333 comic? I know that uh, that was the thing in the 90s with Marvel was that they were increasing like quarter a quarter every time there was an increase. But once they hit two or three bucks, I th or yeah, it was two bucks, then it was... They jumped up. Uh, okay, the other thing that uh, you were commenting
focusing on. And in uh, over 40 years, you're the only person that has noticed this is the, um, the Sarah Silhouette thing. <laughs> it's it's. I only noticed it because I read the first three issues and I like they all have that same ending and I'm like, well, why don't why don't how issue four ends and I got to that one I'm like, okay, and that's what where I'm gonna you know it's something that I just noticed. That was uh, square one. That was the the first panel of the first issue of Therabus. Therabus is a tiny silhouette. You can't even really tell that. Uh, where he, he, he stops and the horse begins. So it was uh, always going back to square one, uh, panel one in, uh, in, in the early story because I didn't know how many of these I was going to be able to do. And this was certainly uh, my experience was it didn't matter what I did, I was always back at square one. Which uh, was why I called uh, 112, 113 square one. Okay, that makes sense. Because it was uh, definitely the sense that I had. And remember, like I was a, I was a complete atheist. Uh, at the time, uh, why is this? Why, why, why are there people like me who are always getting sent back to square one? And there are all these other people where uh, they have a success, and then this just giant vista of success opens up in front of them. Like, how does that work? Right. And uh, from my perspective now, um, well, not not strictly from my perspective now, but certainly uh, after I became religious, I looked back at it and went, "No, this was this was a saving grace in your life that you." You didn't have that kind of success uh, because uh, there are more unhappy stories attached to that kind of success than there are happy stories attached to that kind of success. It, that's really one of those um, there, but for the grace of God, go I. Um, Before I became religious, I did I did have intimations of it, though. I did, uh, when, when Image came along, and, you know, they had this absolutely unimaginably explosive success. And uh, out of the seven guys, the, the, the one guy who was actually doing what I was doing which was producing his book was you know on uh, was Larson on uh, on Savage Drag. Right. Uh, everybody else went the whole Hollywood route, and I think that was a sort of a an after the fact explanation of well, this is why your life had to go and has to go the way that it's going because you would have. You would have gone off in this direction. It's like, uh, uh, as as attractive as that looks, uh, the big pile of money and uh, the the giant commercial success uh, definitely has its own gravitational pull, and that that pulls you away from what's actually important to you. Uh, talking to Talking to Kevin Eastman uh, the last time when I talked to him on the phone, and 
interesting to have those kinds of wheels turn around in that way where what I had already suspected I get confirmed for me from the guy that actually went through it. Right. I can see that. Okay, well, that just about uses up our hour, I'm afraid. Uh, I did I did a lot more of the talking this time than you did. Yeah, but it's please hold for Dave Sim, not please hold for Matt Dow, so it's fine by me. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, trying not to leave off on, on a down note or a somber note, uh, I was talking to Bob Burton uh, just a couple of weeks back, and... Uh, he had a very, what I consider a very funny suggestion, which was uh, Donald Trump should uh, should make Bernie Sanders the uh, American ambassador to Venezuela, so he can see what an actual socialist country looks like. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, <laughs> it's a suggestion. I, I don't think it's going to happen, but I, it's a suggestion. <laughs> Uh, I, I would I would definitely like to be a fly on the wall if that happens anyway. <laughs> I would like to hear the tape the fly on the wall made of that of the of of that conversation when it happens, but I don't think I'd actually want to be on the wall. <laughs> there you go. Okay, well that does it for another then, then Matt. Okay. Thanks. All right. Talk to you again next month. Uh, we'll talk to you then. Say Say hi to Paula and uh, and Janice. Janice's uh, birthday card is and it's not in the mail because she's she's the end of this month, right? The thirty first. Correct. And it's turning eight. Correct. That that boggles my mind that uh, Janice Pearl is turning eight. I still picture her as a baby. I uh, we have a. F f f photo frame with a bunch of photos and one of them is day one like within three hours of her being born I picked her up and held her and she reached her little hand up to touch my, try to touch my face and we got a picture of it and every time I walk past it I'm like and that kid is now four feet tall and yep. dancing and running around and just barrel energy and I think she was so sweet what happened I remember the uh, the birth announcement where you wrote, uh, "Look upon my works, ye mighty, and tremble." Yep. <laughs> That's. Uh, oh, it still cracks me up. <laughs> when Natasha was born, I went online and I, I posted the video of John Hurt at the dinner scene from Alien, and said, "If you know what's going on, you'll understand." And everybody went, "There's something wrong with you, Matt." And then I followed it up with the 1933 Frankenstein, Universal Frankenstein, It's Alive, It's Alive, Now I Know What It Feels Like to Be a God. <laughs> and everybody understood what, what I was talking about after that one. Okay, good. And they still look at you funny. Oh, yeah, everybody looks at me funny. <laughs> All right. All right, you have a good month, and uh, we will talk to you in April. Yep. Have a good one, Dave. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.